Today we're going to talk about the Eurozone Lemma. Recall that the Eurozone Lemma says that if you have a T4 topological space, remember what does that mean? That means that the any pair of closed subsets of X can be separated by open neighborhoods. If we have that condition on our topological space, then any pair of disjoint closed subsets can actually be separated by a function. This is a remarkable theorem because x here needn't have come from anything involving the real numbers, but what is being asserted is that you can use the T4 condition to construct a function which lands in the real numbers. And that transition into the world of real numbers is the sort of key interesting idea inside the Eurozone Lemma. So here's how the proof goes. We're going to start off with an auxiliary set of the dyadic rationals. So these are just the rational numbers whose denominators are powers of 2. And I'm going to arrange these. I'm only going to look at the dyadic rationals between 0 and 1. And I'll actually include both 0 and 1 in that. So these are the dyadic rationals contained in the closed interval from 0 to 1. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a family of open sets. That collection of open sets is going to be indexed by the dyadic rationals. And we're going to use that to construct for ourselves a function. So a Eurozone family is a family of open sets U R indexed by the dyadic rationals. So there's going to be one open set for every dyadic rational, such that if R1 is strictly less than R2, then not only is U R1 contained in U R2, but in fact the closure of U R1 is contained in U R2. So the program is that I'm going to use a Eurozone family to construct a function and I'm going to use the T4 condition to construct the Eurozone family. And in that way, I'll ensure that the T4 condition actually implies the presence of the function that will separate my Z1 and Z2. So let's do it. Given a Eurozone family, U R, I'll define the corresponding Eurozone function which will be a function from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1. And what will I do? Well, I'm going to look at all of the ur's that contain a point x of x, and I'm going to look at the infimum of those r's. So this will be a number between 0 and 1, possibly including 0 or 1. And I'm going to show now that that function, which is a well-defined function on all of x, is actually a continuous function. That's the key point. So again, just the presence of a family of functions that are indexed by these dyadic rationals is sufficient for me to start constructing this function because I can simply take the infimum over all of those indices such that x is contained in u of that index. Okay, so how do we prove that the Eurozone function is actually continuous. Let's do it. Well, I'll use my favorite subbase for the closed interval from 0 to 1. It consists of these half open intervals here and here. Now, a quick argument shows that if you look at the inverse image of this initial segment, then this is just the union over all the dyadic rationals less than our s of u r. And conversely, if we take the inverse image of this half open interval of the sort of ending segment of my interval, then that's the union over all the dyadic rationals bigger than s of the complement of the closure of u r. In each case, the key thing to use here is the fact that the dyadic rationals are dense inside the closed interval from 0 to 1. Notice that in each of these cases, the result here is a nice open subset of our x because it's a union of open sets in each case. So this is quite an advantage. This little lemma says that if I want to construct a function from x to 0, 1, 
then it's enough for me to construct this Eurozone family. So my focus now is shifted to actually trying to use the T4 condition to construct my Eurozone family. So my goal is to construct the Eurozone family UR in such a way that Z0, that's one of my closed subsets, is completely contained in U0, and U1 is completely contained in the complement of Z1. And then I have this Eurozone family, which is going to interpolate between U0 and U1. Okay, let's do it. So the basic program is the following. We're going to begin by simply taking U1 to be exactly the complement of Z1. And now using our condition T4, we're entitled to select an open set U0 such that Z0 is contained in U0 and the closure of U0 is contained in U1. So now we want to continue inductively and define UR for R any dyadic rational. So here I'm going to look at dyadic rationals of the form 2 to the minus n times m, where n is some natural number, m is strictly greater than 0 and strictly less than 2 to the n, and we're going to assume that it's odd. So what's the point? So we're going to work recursively, and I want to say how to def use T4 to define the next set u 2 to the minus n m. And the point is, is that because of the T4 condition, I'm entitled to choose an open set such that u 2 to the minus n m is completely contained in u 2 to the minus n m plus 1, but it in turn contains the closure of u 2 to the minus n m minus 1. All told then, that produces now this new open set and proceeding recursively, I fill out the entire dyadic rationals. And I've defined this in such a way that it precisely has the condition that I wanted in order to be a Eurozone family. Namely that if you have a pair of dyadic rationals R1 and R2, that R2 contains the closure of R1 whenever R2 is strictly greater than R1. Okay, so that completes the proof. That proves now that if we have a T4 topological space, that for every pair of disjoint closed subsets, I can find a function from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that all of the points of Z1 go to 0, and all of the points of Z2 go to 1. Lie down. Roll over. Sit. Stay. Jump around. <laughs> Jump around. So what use can this lemma be put to? Here's an exciting example of just this sort of phenomenon. So suppose that X is a compact Hausdorff space for which there exists a countable base. That is to say, a base for X consisting of open sets, but only countably many of those open sets. If that's the case, then X is homeomorphic to a closed subspace of 0, 1 to the omega. This is the product of countably many copies of the closed interval from 0 to 1. This is sometimes called the Hilbert cube. If X is any compact Hausdorff topological space for which there is a countable base, then X is a closed subspace of this Hilbert cube. So how do we prove this? Well, we begin by selecting a countable base, B, for our x. This consists of u0, u1, dot, dot, dot. So we've enumerated this in some way, and it's countable so that this is just indexed over the natural numbers. And then what we'll do is we'll let R be the set of pairs of natural numbers, such that the closure of um is contained in un. By the Eurozone lemma, we know that for every such pair of natural numbers, we can write down a continuous map fmn from x to the closed interval from 0 to 1, such that every point in the closure of um goes to 0, 
and every point in the complement of un goes to 1. That's something that's just simply guaranteed by the Eurozone Lemma. Once you have that, that gives you a family of functions, and we're going to organize that family of functions into one giant map from x into the Hilbert cube. So here's the point. If I have an point of x and an open neighborhood of that x, then I can find pairs of natural numbers, m and n, inside this set r, such that the value of fmn on x is 0, but the value of fmn on the complement of u, this open neighborhood of x, is 1. This is going to allow me to see that this map here that I'm going to construct is actually injective. So I'll take x to the set of maps from this funny set r into 0, 1. There's countably many of these r's. So this is just the Hilbert cube, 0, 1 to the omega. And a map like this, what does it do? It's going to carry a point little x of x to some map from r to 0, 1. What map will I choose? Well, I'm going to carry a pair of maps m, n to this map that we constructed using the Eurozone lemma fmn. That defines for me a nice map. It's a continuous map since each of these fmn's is continuous. And this key lemma tells us that, in fact, this is injective. So now we have a continuous map from a compact Hausdorff space to another compact Hausdorff space. Consequently, that map is actually closed and continuous and injective, so that implies that, in fact, f is a homeomorphism onto a closed subset of this Hilbert cube. And that completes the proof. So this is one of the remarkable powers that the Eurozone Lemma has. It tells you that, in a sense, there's enough continuous functions to the real line for you to do very interesting things with your topological spaces. In the case of a compact Hausdorff space, you can simply regard it as a closed subspace of the Hilbert cube, provided that it has a countable base. Here's a quick corollary of that fact. If you have a compact Hausdorff space, and if it admits a countable base, well, that guarantees it's a subspace of the Hilbert cube. And in fact, that will guarantee that it's actually a compact metric space. What do you have to prove? Well, you simply have to prove that the Hilbert cube itself is in fact a metric space, that the topology on this is induced by a metric. And you can actually simply write one down. Here's an example of how you might write down an explicit metric on 0, 1 to the omega that will induce the product topology. So this is saying something quite strong. This is saying that if your topological space has these purely topological properties, compactness and Hausdorffness, then there is at least one metric that determines that topology. By the way, the metric isn't unique. I'm simply saying that there exists a metric that gives you the topology that you have on your space. Here's another exciting theorem, which is a corollary of the Eurozone Lemma. This is the Hausdorff-Alexander theorem, and it's telling us that in a strong sense, the Cantor space is a kind of universal space. So if we have, again, a compact Hausdorff topological space for which there exists a countable base, then x is necessarily a quotient of the Cantor space C. So we've just seen that if x is a compact Hausdorff topological space for which there exists a countable base, then x is a closed subspace of the Hilbert cube. But at the same time, I'm also telling you that x is a quotient of the Cantor space. Let's see how to prove that. Well, again, we're perfectly allowed to think of x as a closed subspace of the Hilbert cube. And there's a continuous surjection, which goes from the Cantor space, which I'll now regard as the infinite product of the discrete topological space consisting of only 0 and 1, onto the closed interval. And what do you do? You simply use these numbers, zero, the sequence of, of zeros and ones, to construct a series and look at the number to which this series converges inside zero and one. 
So this is a perfectly nice continuous surjection from the Cantor space onto the closed interval from 0 to 1. But at the same time, if I think of 0, 1 to the omega cross omega, that's again just a countable set, so that's the same thing as 0, 1 to the omega, which is again the, the Cantor space. But this object now maps to the closed interval from 0, 1 to the omega. So this gives us a continuous surjection from the Cantor space onto the Hilbert cube. So I can look at my z, which is now a closed subspace of the Hilbert cube, and I can look at its inverse image back in the Cantor space. I certainly have a continuous surjection from that inverse image onto that closed subset. What I need to show is that I have a continuous surjection from the Cantor space onto this inverse image. For that, what will I do? I want to make the following claim. I claim that if you have a closed subspace, Z of the Cantor space, then there's always a continuous map, R, that goes backwards from the Cantor space back to this closed subspace, that on Z itself is just the identity. This is often called a retraction of the inclusion of Z into C. So to define this retraction, we're going to start off by defining a metric on the Cantor space. This is a metric that's going to determine the product topology, and therefore the Cantor space topology. And here's the metric that I'm going to choose. I'm just going to say that if you've got a sequence of zeros and ones and another sequence of zeros and ones, I'll look at the absolute value of the difference between these two things, and I'll divide that by 3 to the n for each n and add the results up. This is a nice convergent sequence. And this metric has the nice property that for any point of the Cantor space, if I look at the map that carries a point, another point of the Cantor space, to the distance from x to y, that map is an injection. That is to say, if I have two different points, y1 and y2, whose distance from my x are the same, then y1 must be equal to y2. That's an unusual but very important property for a metric to have. In particular, we have this nice injection, which is actually continuous. And now, since Z is a closed subspace of the uh, Cantor space, which is compact, it follows that Z itself is compact. And so there's actually a unique R of X attached to any point X of the Cantor space, whose distance from X is the infimum of the distances from x to y as y varies inside z. This infimum is often just described as the distance from the point x to the closed subset z. In other words, r of x is the unique closest point of the closed subspace z relative to this distance function. And certainly it's clear that this R does have one of the properties that we sought. That is to say, if X is in Z, then certainly R of X equals X. Because after all, if X is in Z, then the closest point of Z to X is going to be X itself. So what we need to show is that this R is actually a continuous function. And for this, you can do a sequence calculation. If you have a sequence of points xn converging to your x, then you can look at the distance from x to the limit of the rxn's. Well, this x can itself be written as the limit as n approaches infinity of xn. And since the distance function is continuous, I can pull this limit out. And now I have the limit as n goes to infinity of the distance from xn to rxn. 
And the point of Rxn is precisely that the distance from Xn to Rxn is the same thing as the distance from Xn to Z. Remember, Rxn is the unique closest point of Z to Xn. This function is now a continuous function of the Xn's, so I'm allowed to push that limit back inside, and this becomes the distance from x to z. But once again, the defining property of r of x is that the distance from x to z is the same as the distance from x to rx. And so now I've seen that the distance from x to this limit is the same as the distance from x to rx. But we just said that this distance function is an injective distance function, in the sense that if you have two points that are of the same distance away from x, then those two points have to be equal. But that now means that our rx here must equal this limit. But that's great news because that's exactly what you want out of a continuous function. This now proves that we actually have a continuous function r. Okay, so that proves this claim. That proves that if we have a closed subspace of the Cantor space, then there's a continuous retraction from the Cantor space back down to that closed subspace. That is to say, a continuous map from C down to Z, such that for every point of Z, R of X equals X. So what's the upshot? Well, we have this continuous surjection from C to the inverse image of Z. Remember Z here, is this closed subspace of the Cantor space. And we looked at its inverse image under this map. That gave us a continuous surjection from the inverse image to Z. And all we know about this is that it's a closed subspace of the Cantor space. But I just proved that any closed subspace has a retraction mapping back to it. And I'm gonna use that retraction to map onto that inverse image and compose it with this surjection. And now since this is a map between two compact Hausdorff spaces, that's a surjection, it's automatically a quotient map. And so we've completed our proof.